from Temple University, this is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. Today's guest author, John Rowe Townsend, comes all the way from England. And what city there? Well, I was born in Leeds. I worked for a good many years in Manchester, both of these being northern industrial cities. It's a pleasure to hear your beautiful pronunciation of the English language. Two good friends of yours join me in making you feel welcome. This is Carolyn Field, coordinator of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, my collaborator on Profiles in Literature, and Dr. Rosemary Weber from Drexel University Graduate School of Library Science. Well, Carolyn and Rosemary have both been friends of mine for 10 years past, and I hardly need welcoming to Philadelphia <laughs> because I always feel at home okay. in Philadelphia. Good, good. Uh, Mr. Townsend, your three most related books Pirate's Island, Trouble in the Jungle, and Goodbye to the Jungle focus on the social conditions of English children in a slum you've named the Jungle. Tell us when your interest first became aroused in such children. Oh, it goes back a very long way, but specifically to the writing of these two books, these three books. I suppose it began when I had to do a series of articles on the work of the SPCC, the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And this involved me going out on their rounds with oh, several of the old uniformed SPCC inspectors in the back streets of London and of Manchester. This was in some ways a traumatic experience because I thought I knew something about poverty. Um, I grew up in a poor home financially when I went round with the SPCC inspectors, the, the old cruelty men they used to call them, I realized that I didn't know anything about real poverty because although my own home was a poor one financially, it was a very good home in everything that really mattered. So that for the first time, I was introduced to the fact that there were children who grew up in poor homes spiritually, so to speak, that is, homes where nobody cared about them, nobody bought them proper clothes, nobody gave them proper meals, nobody cared whether they went to school in the morning, nobody maybe talked to them except to shout at them. And this, this affected me very deeply indeed. Did you perchance um, read about a youngster who was raising children himself because of derelict parents? Yes. Um, Incidentally, in the city of Manchester, England, about 200 people are deserted by their parents every year. I would imagine major industrial cities elsewhere in England, and for all I know in America, could produce similarly horrifying statistics. Uh, yes, there was a story in our evening paper. This was when I was working on a morning newspaper called the Manchester Guardian. There was a story in our evening paper about a woman who had four children and her husband had walked out on her, and she was getting very tired of trying to bring up these four children on very little money. And one day she packed a little bag, and she took the kids with her to the bus stop, and she got on the bus, and off she went. And they didn't see her again. And the four children went home, and the eldest of them, who was a boy aged around 12, uh, was afraid that the family would be split up, and they would all be sent into separate homes. And he didn't want this to happen because they were a very solid little family. And so for three or four days, he looked after the younger children and made meals for them and generally took what care of them he could. Well, of course, it couldn't last, and the powers that be did catch up with them. But the, the last I heard was a sort of a kind of a happy ending because the mother was found, and she was already sorry about what she'd done, and a lot of people rallied round and the home was put together again, and life went on. But it did influence the writing of Trouble in the Jungle, the episode in Trouble oh, in well, the yes, Jungle, right? Oh, yes, indeed it did, yes. Um, another of your books in that series uh, 
shows that urban renewal doesn't solve all of the problems, as we'll see in a dramatized episode. In Goodbye to the Jungle, the poverty-stricken Thompsons have left the slum and are trying to survive in an almost barren project home. The family consists of a lazy uncle, Walter, his companion, Doris, his children, and the real household managers, an orphaned niece and nephew. Are you through peeling the potatoes, Sandra? We don't have any, Doris. Nip along to parade then, Sandra, and get me five pounds of potatoes, two pound jar of plum jam, and a quarter of shilling tea. All right, give me the money. They can put it on the bill. Well, they won't. Not at Johnson's North, Leonard. Not till you've paid something off. Going on the other way then. Down the Westwood Road, there's more shops up by the bus terminal. I'll still need money. Still, I guess we've got to have some to eat here. Well, it's no good looking like that. It's your uncle. He took off two days this week, so he only drew six pounds. And lucky he didn't get the sack. And then he has to go and take ten bob of it and put it on the nose. And it loses, of course. And then he has to spend all last night down at the Dragon drinking. You were with him, weren't you? Shut your flipping trap! Yeah. Look at this junk we've got here. It isn't even much of that. Call it furniture, it isn't even fit to be firewood. Should see the stuff they're selling down at Widdison's shop. Down on the parade. Lovely. And everybody else can have it, but not us, no. Well, if you want to know, I'm sick of it. Sick up to me back teeth. Years of it in other places, and it's just the same here. Struggling along with all four of you and never enough money. Well, it disheartens me, that's what it do. It disheartens me. I'm sick of hearing her, always feeling sorry for herself. Cheer up, Sandra. I think Doris is changing. Well, if she did, it could only be for the better. But I haven't noticed any sign. Still, she is changing. A year or two ago, she wouldn't have been going on about furniture. She didn't care. It wasn't worth caring in the jungle. But she wanted to leave the jungle. Uncle Walter didn't, but she did. See what I mean? She's getting tired of living like this. Then why doesn't she do something about it? Such as keeping the house clean. If you and I didn't clean it a bit each day, it'd be as bad as the old one by now. Well, you know what she is. It takes a lot to get her moving. <laughs> but remember when Mrs. Robbins came in from next door? Doris was jealous about her clothes and her hair doing a little boy being so well turned out. I'll tell you what it is, Sandra. I reckon now Doris is getting old and she'd like to be more respectable. And coming here to Westwood, where everything is clean and nice, has brought it on more strongly. She never wanted to be like all the other women before, but now she does. Some hope. Sandra? Remember Batten's junk shop on Camellia Hill? They had lots and lots of furniture. Very cheap that people didn't want to take with them when they moved. Some of it looked all right. But if we picked it carefully, we could get everything we need for a few pounds to make the house decent. Where would we get a few pounds? We'd have to sell something. What have we got to sell? Well, I don't know. Perhaps we could earn something. We made some money from selling firewood once. It would take years before we made enough. We could ask the welfare people. They often help people get the things they need. Begging. It isn't begging if it's things you've got to have. Of course it's begging. And you needn't think I'm going on my knees to anybody. Well then, 
We'll sell the watches. Oh, Sandra, I feel sick to think of doing that because these watches are so special to us. Our reward for catching those crooks at Gumbel's Yard. I know what you mean. They're the only thing of value that we own. And we've had no end of a job keeping them out of Uncle Walter's hands. Still, if we have to part with them, we will. Well, Mr. Unselfish, let's see how this jacket fits. I can't mend it anymore. How long have you had this jacket, Kevin? A year or two. It's been longer than that. I know now. Three years ago, you bought it at the Bring and Buy sale at St. Jude's. Half a crown it cost. <laughs> what you need is not furniture, but a new jacket. Thanks for trying to fix it. But clothes don't matter all that much. What we all really need is a proper home. Help me with this check. Trouble follows the quest for new furniture and Kevin has to leave school to help put bread on the table. But the spirit of hope prevails in this realistic fiction. What were you thinking as you saw that, Mr. Townsend? I was thinking that that extract looks kind of tough and they certainly seem to have all the cares of the world piled upon their shoulders. Uh, and if it looks too tough and the kids look a bit overwhelmed by it, all, well, it must be my fault because the aspect of it that I'd rather have emphasized is that in fact they get out and do things. And it does, I hope, end rather hopefully. As you were saying just now, however, uh, when you get on onto a new housing project, I guess your problems are changing or even beginning rather than all being suddenly solved for you. And that extract was well chosen in one way and it illustrates one of the reasons why I wanted to write that particular book. And that was that I felt I knew an awful lot more about Walter and Doris than had ever appeared in Trouble in the Jungle. That is, I knew once they got out to the new housing project, well, Walter was never going to change. And if he was six miles away from his work, he just wasn't going to get to work. Or if he was six miles from the nearest pub, well, he'd find a way. Whereas, as the kids are saying there, I thought it would change Doris. I thought she was just around the time of life when suddenly this weird urge to be respectable would come upon her. But, uh, gee, it did sound kind of tough and look kind of <laughs> tough out there. Uh, that book and four of your others involve Cobchester, England. Mm -hmm. Are Cobchester and Hellersage, is that right? Hellersage, yes. Hellersage, the setting for Hell's Edge, imaginary towns? They're imaginary towns. Uh, they are based on fact. Uh, Cobchester really, although it is fictional, is based upon Manchester, which is the city I was working in. Uh, Gumbel's Yard, which appears in all these books, is really based on the basin of the old Bridgewater Canal built in the 18th century, and a piece of vastly interesting industrial archaeology, I think. And this fascinated me visually one of these scenes that look incredibly ugly when you first see them. Mm -hmm. But if you keep on looking, you see there's a curious kind of beauty about them. Hallersage is not the same. Hallersage is a town in West Yorkshire that is in the Pennine Hills. And it's a combination of about three towns. Halifax, Huddersfield, Liversidge. This is all my country, you see, I'm a Yorkshireman, and uh, I love it very dearly. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Hell's Edge, John, it was a runner-up for the Carnegie Medal in 1963. Now, right. in the United States, we have the Newbery Medal and the Caldecott Medal, both named for Englishmen, mm -hmm. and then the Wilder Award, which is named for an American. And you have these uh, honor medals in England. Could you tell us something about them, the Carnegie and the other one? The Carnegie and the Greenaway, which is for illustration, uh, were started, I think, around 1937. Uh, they were fairly obviously offering the sincerest form of flattery to the American awards. <laughs> and I suppose it was in <coughs> reciprocation for the fact that the Newbery is named after an Englishman, that is the 18th century mm -hmm. publisher, John Newbery, that I suppose the English Library Association wanted to name the Carnegie for an American, Andrew Carnegie, who I understand in my history on these matters is exceedingly shaky, was responsible for a good deal of benefaction to libraries. 
Uh, we do have other awards, but not many, nothing like the number of awards that you have in the United States. Well, what about the uh, one from The Guardian? Do you have something to do with that? I have a good deal to do with that. Um, this has now been established about nine years, and we try to catch uh, writers who have not had major awards, and we try to catch writers who are going to go on to cover themselves with further glory. We try to get the new, give the new ones some, yeah. something to make them uh, feel good. One thing that I'm rather pleased about is that I think the first recognition that Richard Adams had for Watership Down was by winning the Guardian Award. Oh, really? Oh. Although I, I don't kid myself, however, that Watership Down would not have reached the stars without it. Mm. I think Watership Down would have gone up to the stratosphere, mm. whatever had happened. Do the librarians elect who will win the Carnegie and the Kate Greenaway Awards? Correct. Those are librarians' awards. Um, Yes, The Intruder was also a runner-up for the Carnegie, and what gave me, I think, more pleasure even than that, it won the Boston Globe Horn Book Award That's in right. America, which I particularly And liked. the Edgar Award for a mystery uh, Yes, story. that surprised so me. That, I thought that was very good. It well, surprised me very much. I didn't realize I was a writer of mysteries until that. <laughs> uh, John, your latest book, called Forest in the Night, of the Night, is an allegory. I've read it. Could you tell me where you got the idea for it and what it's all about? I'm not sure that I could tell you what it's all about. If I really knew what it was all about, I don't think I'd have had to write the book. I think it was a process of discovery. Where I got the idea for it is fairly obvious. It comes from that very well-known poem of William Blake's. Uh, tiger, 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 burning, burning bright in the forests of the night. Uh, the forest of the night in this book is the city center forest, which is sort of a kind of a forest, I think, particularly at night when a city center can come to seem mysterious and dangerous and menacing. So that was the feeling of the physical setting. The germ of the book within myself was a particular scene, a kind of creation scene, in which the boy will go down, down, down into the buildings, the buildings again being a mysterious, rather perilous location in the city center. He's called upon to, to feed an old and apparently dying man, and as he feeds this old man, uh, he realizes that some very strange change is taking place. Uh, the fire which has been out starts blazing up and throwing great stripes marching across the wall, and the old man dissolves. And eventually, it isn't an old man who's in the room with him at all. It's something else. And the book never actually says what the I something know, else it is. <laughs> uh, but you rather obviously, I suppose, take the hint from the Blake form. But I think that it's for the reader to interpret the book in the light of what he brings to it, in the, in, or she brings to it indeed, and in the light of what he or she needs to draw from it. I think it's not giving very much away to say that rather clearly it has some relation to a boy's passage from boyhood into manhood. It's very poetically written. It, it, uh, there's no question about it. And I think that young people, and I think of it more as a young person's book than a children's book, will uh, enjoy it, particularly those who like poetry. Mm. There's another book that you wrote that is very popular with librarians, and it's called A Sense of Story, mm -hmm. which takes uh, up 19 authors of children's books that you uh, discuss in a critical way, their works right. and give something about their lives. Now, there were, uh, of the 19, 10 were English, six American, and uh, three Australian. How did you select them? And uh, was that a little, uh, why did you emphasize the English over the American. Are there, do you think that there are better English writers at this point, that, or do you know them better? Well, until I actually came to count them up after the event, I didn't realize that the distribution was that, 10 English, 6 American, 3 Australian. It's not intended to reflect the relative importance or prominence of American or English writing, not by any means. I wanted to write about well, people who particularly interested me. The mm -hmm. book is not trying to say these are the Good. 19 most important writers. It 
could well be that being English myself, I felt better qualified to talk about some of the English writers than I did about some Americans. There was also the consideration that as the book is on sale in England as well as in America, we wanted it to be about people whose books were available in England. And at the time the book was being planned, some very well-known American writers, uh, the Cleavers, for example, were just not published in England at all, and it would have I been see. very frustrating yeah. for English readers yes, it would. to read an essay about somebody whose books they just can't get. The Cleavers, of course, are published in England now and uh, very much appreciated in there. Going back to a previous question, John, do you find that there is much difference between writing for children and young adults, or is there any difference at all? I don't think there's a great difference about it. Um, people ask one a good deal about writing for children, and one always wonders just how much one writes for children anyway. I'm reminded of a recent reply that Joan Aiken made to this question, and she said, how do I know who it's for till I see who reads it? <laughs> so there is something of that in it. So I think as a craftsman, the, the writer is probably writing for himself before anybody else. You know, if you don't please yourself, you don't deserve to please anyone. I think also, however, at the same time, it's not exactly contradictory. There has to be some sense of audience. Mm -hmm. And so I think probably if you're writing a book for the children's list, you have somewhere around the edges of your mind a shadowy audience, which is probably of yourself as a child and your children mm -hmm. and your children's friends. And if you're writing what is now called a young adult book, then I suppose the shadowy audience has moved on a little and grown up a little. So it isn't quite the same, and the orientation of the book isn't quite the same. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that the difference is absolutely crucial. I think basically a writer is or ought to be a person with a book inside him hollering to get out. Mm. Mm. In Written for Children, published in 1973, you stated that there is no young adult category in Britain, but aren't your books The Summer People, which is my favorite, Good Night Prof Dear, Hell's Edge, and The Intruder, more appropriate for young adults than for children? Yes, I think probably they are. One of the problems we have in England is that of getting books to the audiences that would really appreciate them most. As you say, in England we don't have young adult libraries uh, we have children's libraries which seem to work on the assumption that you suddenly grow up overnight somewhere around your 14th birthday and that's it. There are a lot of books being published in England now, and I'm not thinking particularly or mainly of my own, for which the natural audience, I think, would be not only young people but adults. Mm -hmm. But adults just don't know about these books and the organization doesn't seem able to make them known to adults. Well, I think it's much easier to publicize children's books because there are less of them printed each year. Mm -hmm. And more, more attention can be paid, and librarians certainly pay more attention to children's books mm -hmm. than they do to the adult. Mm -hmm. Don't you find, though, that it seems to me that putting them into paperback sort of blurs this line because occasionally the paperback dealer doesn't know where to put the book, right. mm -hmm. and he puts it in the wrong place, and then adults mm -hmm. find it. Do you find that there are any taboos that... that um, you have in writing for children uh, that you don't have for young adults, or don't we have any taboos in writing for children anymore? <laughs> well, I think these taboos have toppled pretty steadily over the past few years. Mm. When Trouble in the Jungle, the English title was Gumbel's Yard, was first published nearly 15 years ago, there was a certain amount of alarm in England because the grown-ups, Walter and Doris, were rather obviously not married. Mm -hmm. I can remember a young lady interviewing me on behalf of the BBC and she looked at me accusingly and she said, Mr. Townsend, you have written a sordid book for children. Why? And I found that question rather difficult to answer. I have a horrid feeling my mouth probably opened and closed like a goldfish <laughs> in a bowl. But what I hoped, I said, was that I didn't think of it as a sordid book. Mm. I hoped it was a book about children triumphing over diff difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm and that it certainly was not squalid at all. Uh, also, one or two people um, complain mildly about my second book, Hell's Edge, that it should have such a word as hell in the title. Oh, really? Yes, okay. and um, the American publishers, I think, were a little doubtful about it at first. This was not Lippincott, my mm -hmm. present publishers. Um, now, of course, anything seems to go. Mm -hmm. um, 
Well, as a librarian, we still get letters from parents, though, whether, whether everything seems to go or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So One would almost think that determined attempts had been made, sometimes misguided. Mm -hmm. In my last book, but two, I think it was, Goodnight Prof, dear. Um, I suppose the dialogue probably could have accommodated the ultimate four-letter words, which all have now appeared in books on the children's or YA necessary. list. Well, exactly, Carolyn. Yeah, so that was the question I asked myself, and I thought, right, there is enough in this book. If we start doing that, really it's sensationalism, and one That's should right. not do it for the sake of doing it. One should only do it if the context absolutely demands it. Right. And I thought that although indeed the book could accommodate these words, and although indeed they would be perfectly probable in the context, actually in a written book they would be sensational, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that it was therefore better to omit them. But I don't really think the taboo applies very much anymore. May I ask you what some of your present and future writing plans are? Well, I have just finished a book which is called Noah's Castle. It will be published in England this fall and in the United States, I understand, next spring. This is a book in which the principal character, although he's not the hero, the principal character is a father who is determined that whatever happens to anybody else, his family is going to be all right. The book is set in a time of economic catastrophe, maybe two or three years in the future from whenever you are reading the book, um, in a time of outrageous inflation so that you pay millions for a loaf of bread, when you have armies of unemployed rather dangerously roaming the streets. But father, who saw all this coming, is a very cunning man, uh, has bought an old Victorian house and he's crammed the basement of this house with everything that he can need over the next year or two. Gradually, as it becomes known what he's got, it becomes evident that he's going to have to conduct, he's going to have to face a siege. But his family, he has a wife and four children of various ages, gradually find their moral position untenable so that they kind of peel away from him. And in the end, father is left heroically defending nobody and nothing. Mm. What a shame. Uh, what a shame. Well, uh, father, I found, um, he's a rather complex character because in some ways he's an absolutely dreadful man. And yet, I think you probably, in the end, feel some sympathy for him. Isn't he looking out for his family? Isn't that yes, one indeed. of the uh, major redeeming yeah. qualities? Right. Yes. You know, right. uh, um, is it uh, not true that um, we're going to have to wind this up? But, uh, but uh, do your publishers sometimes retain British terminology to give authenticity and flavor? Because I noticed as I was reading that in lieu of card table, there was deal table in lieu of flashlight, torch, etc. Is that the reason why some of the British terminology is kept in the books by Lippincott when they publish them for American readers? I don't know. I think these days, probably on both sides of the Atlantic, we tend to assume that practically all these phrases can be understood perfectly mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. And if it stops a reader just for a moment while he adjusts to the fact that sneakers are, are plimsolls or vice versa, <laughs> uh, well, it doesn't really do any harm. You know, he's learned some small, unimportant, mm. but mildly interesting fact. But I think probably these days publishers worry rather less about translating words mm. that the reader really can translate for himself. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Rowe Townson is not only known for his fiction for adolescents and children, but also uh, has been a journalist for over 20 years for the Manchester Guardian and is still their children's book editor. He lectures widely and has written two books about children's literature, reviews that appear in the New York Times Book Review, critical essays, and has edited a book of modern poetry. It's a pleasure to have you as our guest.